come, let us draw near to God with hearts full of love, seeking unity and peace that surpasses understanding. For he alone can bind us together in perfect harmony. And this is In The Moment. I'm your host, Reverend Ricky Allen Jr., thanking you as always on this lovely day the Lord has made. And wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I just pray that the Lord Jesus Christ is out front, especially now that the election's done and we can focus on turkey and all the trimmings. And as the family gets together, I want you all to pray with one another. There are many people out there that are mad, but in any contest, there's a winner and a loser. And we need to remember that, and we need to reteach that to our generations to come. That way they will know how to win and know how to lose. Good winners were once upon a time great losers. We should keep that in mind as we move forward as a country, as you move forward as a family, as we move together as a body of Christ. So let's get started. Our morning scripture reading comes from Ephesians 4, 2 through 5. Ephesians 4, 2 through 5 reads as follows. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And right now we need to remember that oneness. We need to remember the unity that our country so desperately needs. You know, sometimes I feel like that social media has got folks running wild. They're cutting their hair, divorcing their spouses, just, just going crazy. I don't know if it's clickbait or if these folks really do feel this way. In any time we're dealing with politics, there's always gonna be those who are hopeful and those who feel hopeless. For the hopeful out there, invite the hopeless to church. Pray with them, please. Like we're gonna do now. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you with hearts longing for unity and peace across our nation. In these times when opinions differ and emotions run high, we ask for your spirit to cover us with grace humility and understanding. Teach us to love one another, not as the world loves, but as you have loved, unconditionally, sacrificially. Have the Holy Spirit break down the walls of division and often hardened hearts that we may seek reconciliation over strife and forgiveness over resentment. We pray for the leaders, communities, and every person within this country to be bound together by a shared vision of love, justice, and righteousness that mirrors your kingdom. May our words and actions reflect the peace of Christ, and may we work together as one body, united in purpose and hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our topic today is remembering the ultimate objective. Remembering the ultimate objective. And our scripture comes from John 17, 20 through 23, which reads as follows. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reading of your already blessed word. Lord, help us remember why we're here. When things go our way and when things don't go our way and we claim the cross of Christ, we claim you as our redeemer, we claim you as our sustainer, help us remember the ultimate objective. 
the one that you gave us so long ago that we maintain right now. Help us be positive. Help us think about these things on a daily basis. Help us bring them back to remembrance when the world wants us to respond the way they do. And we'll forever give your name the glory, the honor, and the praise. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Regardless of who you voted for, someone is going to be upset. Someone is going to be happy. Someone is going to cheer. Someone is going to cry. Someone is going to lose hope. Someone is going to have their hope restored. We see this in our sporting events as well. To be an American, you have to have a heart of a kaleidoscope, so to speak. You don't know what you're looking at and how it even came to be, yet when viewed closely, it's beautiful, unique, and the more it turns, the more it evolves into something even more precious and beautiful. To be a follower of Jesus Christ is much different our view is clear. Jesus came to die for all, not just a few. Everyone who believes that Jesus Christ is Lord will be saved. His word is his, ho is his word. People have tried to alter, manipulate, distort this throughout history. His word remains true, focused, solid. The priorities of Christ are not chaotic. They're realistic, and at times this truth even hurts. Even Jesus said in Matthew 10, 34 through 36, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, for I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. But I want you to know today that while we see that happening in houses all over, this desire for all to come into relationship with him is still there. This is why sharing the gospel was the change and the charge before his ascension. Who's going to tell them the way? Who's going to relay the pathway to eternity? It's why we all, in our politics, in our life experiences, when we come to know Christ, the new creature that the Apostle Paul speaks of in 2 Corinthians 5.17, where he talks about how the new is here, we have to embrace it. People need to see what it's like. We want them to watch so that we can point them to Jesus. Yes, you may have had a horrible childhood, but Jesus, yes, the money might be slow right now, but Jesus Christ, yes, you may have made mistakes in your marriage and your family, but Jesus, the difference between you and the non-believer is your fact of faith. You were there, right there where they are, but you have now a divine conjunction, a bridge that God built to relocate you in your mess from being alone in a world, fumbling through it to being in the kingdom of God, being cleaned up, ready to serve and give God the glory. Even in this post-election fallout where people are cutting their hair off, screaming on camera, breaking up their relationships. And even if it's all for a few clicks, we need to reach out to these people and let them know, regardless of who you voted for, I know a God that sent his son and his name is Jesus and he came to a world that rejected him, and yet he died on the cross for it anyway, because he's bigger than your feelings, bigger than your opinions. And what he did saved you, and you didn't even know it.
many of which still don't understand it. But he did it anyway. And you don't know yet, but God willing, you will. This is the zeal we show through our lives. So when it comes to us, the, the senders, the deliverers of the gospel, all of us, Jesus has thought of you. He knows how muddy this will get. And he has prayed over the ultimate objective left with us in the Great Commission. This act of going. We find ourselves in John 17, 20 through 23, and we're looking at three verses in the prayer Jesus was praying for his disciples. And we see a shift here, beginning at verse 20. He, he was praying over his disciples, and he goes from that to praying for the entire situation he is putting them in. The ultimate objective is for all to know God through Jesus. He's putting this in the hands of a few men, not perfect, not shine, but men who are faithful, who believe nonetheless. And it's, comfort, it's a comforting thing to remove the thought that as a believer, you got to be perfect. But it does not give you room to make intentional error. Satan uses that to keep people away. He tells them that you're not perfect and they're hypocrites. Yet folks go to work every day and will eat lunch with folks they don't like and smile at a boss they can't stand. So we see here the prayer shifted, not just from the disciples, but everything around them. So how does Jesus help us remember the ultimate objective. The first thing Jesus does is he prays over the message sent about him through the disciples, one that we would share as well. Verse 20 says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message. He's not just praying for the messenger, but the people who will hear the message sent through them. This is important. How we relay God's word to the lost must be handled carefully, but current, relevant, without the compromise. It's got to be understandable. It's got to point to Christ. It doesn't need to be a sales pitch. It's not about how many people we can get in here to do stuff with because we want to be an active church, because we desire to be an active body of believers. It's, it's not about being able to brag to the community that you baptize 100 people that did not come back to the church the next Sunday. And in fact, you really don't know where they are. To you, they end up just being a check in the box. And it leaves you doubting, did they ever know who Christ was? Because to know Christ is to have the desire to know the church. Look at, look at the text. It's about them coming to Jesus through what you say. Also notice the guarantee and the effectiveness. There are people out there who will come to know the Lord based off of what you said to them. It doesn't give a percent of those people, but it's certainty someone will come. And I think it's good here to pause for us a moment in time and say these things out loud that we all know to be true. And maybe you're out there right now and you feel like, you're not being a real effective believer and you might even be discouraged in certain points. Maybe you've been reaching out to a loved one or to a friend or to a colleague and you're not getting any headway and you're waiting for the wind to hit your sail just right so you can really take off. Ministry is hard. Ministry is not for the faint of heart. Ministry is not about you. 
ministry is a space where you're trying to present something to a soul that's far beyond them. You're presenting the message of hope that goes beyond this world into the next. And when you're doing that, those things in the darkness are gonna come after you. We know what we're talking about here. We're talking about those unclean spirits, those demons. And you're going to feel as if though, nothing is working right. I would encourage you to first of all, stay in prayer. I would also encourage you to make sure you keep your head in some books. Continuously educate yourself on different perspectives of ministry and how other folks have progressed and how they have handled situations that you're in. It's nothing like getting a second thought. That's why we are a body of believers, people. But above all else, break open your Bible and look at what the earliest believers went through. Look at their challenges and you're going to realize there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun when it comes to trials in ministry. And everybody's a minister. Just some of us are called to higher office, but we're all called to share the gospel. It's not the pastor's job alone. It's not the officer's job alone. If you're going to a church, a body of believers who are giving God the glory, you should have the desire to go out there and tell folks about Jesus Christ. So we see here that Jesus prays over the message sent about him through the disciples. And then he prays over the unity for people to believe. Verse 21 through 22, that all of them may be one father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. He prays over the message. He prays over the unity of the saints and he prays over the connection with him. Why? Because people out here can talk all day and it sounds Christian. It may even feel Christian to you. It might sound nice. It might sound motivating. And they may leave Jesus Christ completely out the message. Because see, the world has created this Christianity type culture without Christ. It is, it's, it's backwards and people are falling for it. They have gotten so far away from hearing God's word and they're feeling like that everything should be feeding them and they give nothing to the glory of God. They're going to these churches and, and being consistently affirmed every Sunday and they leave there wondering why they feel the way they feel still and why they, they, they just can't get it right because you're not hearing God's word. You're hearing a motivational speaker get up there and project onto you everything about what's going to happen to you, what, what, where you're going to win, how you're going to get the breakthrough. And then you leave there still empty. Why am I empty? Why am I, I you got to come back. You got to get it again. Then you got to come back. You got to get it again. You're going to stay thirsty until you look in the vase and see what you're drinking. You're going to remain thirsty. God's work and quench that thirst. And you always know what's going on when you realize you left somewhere still thirsty. I would encourage you to have the drive and the fire to know God's word, to understand God's word, and to execute God's word. If you're constantly getting motivational speeches just to make you feel good, then my question is, what are you doing for the kingdom? Or are you waiting for something to be done for you? 
you've been saying it all your believing lives, John 3.16. And here's a little razzle-dazzle if we're going to tell the truth and shame the devil. We need to start at reciting verses 17 through 18 as well. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the truth through love because God wants to know you, desires to know you, but you must know Jesus to know God. Not know in the sense of knowledge, but know in the sense of of relationship no in the sense of kingship and lordship which means you must surrender your life everything you have everything you know to jesus christ to get there and some people think they can just skip the line because they know they they know that that if they if they do this whatever way of life they desire to live is over that's why you see a lot of these False prophets, they stay in the Old Testament. Nothing's wrong with the Old Testament, but you see them consistently twisting scripture in the Old Testament because the coming to the age of grace with Jesus Christ, that removes their conversation. You gotta point to the cross now. And many of them, we wanna be real about it, don't wanna point to the cross. They wanna point to them. They love talking about the Old Testament leaders. They love comparing themselves to the Old Testament prophet. But when it comes to Jesus, they, they, they rarely speak about him because they know that removes them out of the conversation, out of the place in the conversation they want to be. There is the oneness we need to have in here so that the oneness in our message is seen out there. So the world may bear witness to the oneness we have in our relationship with Jesus so that they may know he is Savior, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the way, the truth, the life, so they may know he's the Almighty, the Alpha and Omega, the Apostle of our profession, the Arm of the Lord, the Bread of Life, the Chief Shepherd. The ultimate objective is to come to know Jesus and see it through all of us so that they may know he's true, his word is true, and it is faithful. Not to mention the only way to get to heaven. And then finally, we see here the desire of Christ is that the unity prayed for brings confirmation to his love here on earth. Verse 23, I am them and you and me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. This isn't a halfway process, but a complete one. He prays over the message. He prays over the unity of believers. He prays over the unity of believers with God through Christ via the understanding no one comes to the Father but through him for the goal of complete unity. And when this happens, the world will know the reason that all races, all classes, and cultures are able to come together at the cross because of the love that Jesus had for us to die for our sins. It all connects, just as we should all be connected as a body of believers. This era of cultural and racial priority over the cross must come to an end. This, this dispensation that's been lingering around us for the past 20 to 30 years that's trying to find a resurgence must be suppressed. In heaven, there will be no black folk section. There will be no white folk section. It will only be God's people together knowing that our time here on earth 
was worth the access to heaven. And when we get there and when we look around, we should be able to smile, enjoying, knowing that what I prayed for on earth, it is in heaven. And because I believed, because I worked at it, because I knew I wasn't perfect, but I kept believing, I kept remaining faithful to God's word. Even when they call you a sellout, even when they say you're breaking ranks, even when they tell you that you are a traditionalist, even when they tell you that you're on the wrong side of history. I'm here to plead with you with everything that I have. Look to the cross. This is where our Savior died. This is where everything comes into focus. You're looking for peace through the wrong channels. You're trying to maintain these worldly rules that were made a long time ago that weren't even right. And you're trying to redeem them through your life now. And time is passing. God wants you to be happy. God wants you to be at peace. The peace that goes beyond all understanding. But he can't do that. He, you don't get it as long as you are going to do what your community tells you to do. Do what the world tells you to do. Well, this is how we do it. This is how we've always done it. Has destroyed more lives, has suppressed more success stories than anything else in the world. Turn to the Lord. Know Jesus for yourself. Don't let the world creep into the church, the bride of Christ. We should be smarter than a sports team. I know all y'all are watching football right now, and we're watching these men come together, whole organization comes together, various walks of life, various different stories, and they get on that field. Everybody has their role to play. And the, the objective is to go 10 inches every time until you score. Or may, maybe it's a baseball team. Maybe it's a basketball team. They come from everywhere in life and they come together all with the one goal in mind. Not just to win games, to win championships. Let us be more than just a winning team, but one that brings all to the cross. That people can see the Jesus in us. Because our only victory is in Christ Jesus. Our only victory over sin is through Christ Jesus. We can do nothing on our own. We're, we're foolish people without Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and you, you need that level of prayer, and you, you've been trying to do this on your own for whatever reason, or maybe you've just discovered God's word for the very first time. I want you to reach out to us on our website, and I want you to go to AIM Christian TV and send me a message. Let's pray about it. Let's make that happen. Because I, I want you to know that our ultimate objective is not about me, it's not about Rick, it's not about people that go to Bethany Covenant in Du Bois, Pennsylvania. It's about Jesus Christ. Get out of your own head and understand who Jesus is truly, not as the world has told you, but through the message given to the people that truly believe and are not just here for the coffee and donuts, who are not just here believing in the safe space of a church, but are here because they are truly concerned about their soul and yours. Until next time, may God bless you, may heaven smile upon you, and God willing, we will see you next week. You take care.